Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world after we put the finishing touches on the forge on Argent Spear. Now, these are the finishing functional touches, not the finishing detail touches, but we were able to build a second level to our forge beneath the one that we built a couple episodes ago. So now we have here the start of our own personal forging area. And something I realized after the end of the episode is that I made way too many forges for up here. I think what I want to do is probably put a couple of campfires here, the fire pits, that we can actually smelt some metal together. And then maybe like out here somewhere, and maybe we'll even like wall this off, we need a place to put some ingot molds so that we can, you know, smelt some metal and actually cast ingots rather than doing that down in the little basement crypt where we started doing everything else up here. I've also been busy between episodes when I'm not stoking the fire underneath the steel production. I have made us 30 tin bronze lanterns and enough for 31 more as far as tin bronze plates go. I did run out of candles except for these five here, but I'm saving these because I wanted to show you the results of a brief panning operation I did, including this book, which is a diary. Oh, okay, also nothing new. Okay. I think we're done with all the books. I hadn't seen one of the seems to be some sort of diary type before, or at least not for a while, so I thought it would have been safe to try, but, well, it was safe. We got nowhere with it. Now, in today's episode, we need to start getting ready for episode 100, and we're going to have a second world tour, and we will take a look at all of the things that have been done in this world since episode 51, or starting with episode 51. And we need to dress for the occasion, so we want to fix up our armor, specifically some of the new armor we got from the luxury traders. And over here, we have the start of some armor. We have the Forlorn Hope Breastplate and the Forlorn Hope Greaves, but yours truly was a dummy and didn't buy the helmet, opting for a second set of greaves. That was a while ago, so it's, you know, water under the bridge, right? Yeah, sure, sure. But yes, yeah, so today I want to go and get a helmet from a trader, and then we need to go and mine out some gold, and we have a couple of great places to find gold. We have gold here, which is right by this broken transicator, and we also have some gold over here, and up here, basically all around us. So we're in the silver and just next to the gold. And as far as our route is considered, I think we should head west. We'll stop by this artisan, maybe Sarava Goods. I might make some bread to sell to him. And then we can hit these two luxury merchants and maybe these two artisans as well to recoup some of the gears we're going to spend because we have, as I recall, a bunch of diamonds and things. Here we go. One emerald, one diamond, and a whole bunch of peridots. So, yeah, I think we can make a little bit of cash back and maybe even come out ahead after we buy this helmet. Get it? A head? A helmet? So, I'm going to do a supplies check and probably make it morning, and then we will head out and check out those traders. So, I'm going to also gather up some of the stuff from here and bring these guys with us. And this one gear. I mean, hey, a gear is a gear, right? Money is money. And then I will see you all on this trip. And off we go. Hmm. Spooky. Also spooky. Buy my junk. Parkour. 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 I spotted another trader in... Ah, oh, there you are. On the map. Hello. Treasure hunter. Okay. Well, good to know. See you never. Do you know why these guys can't drive? Because they'd be a sheep at the wheel. Aha, you do have one. 
and at a pretty good price, too. And I think I'll also get some glass. Why not? There's a temporal storm on the way. Winds howling. You better get ready for the storm, Root. You better bunker down for the storm, too, buddy. Sure, why not? And we're gonna bunker down, too. Let's make a little hidey hole in here, and we'll stun it, and then we'll just wait out the night, I guess. And from here, we can watch in relative safety. Wait, no, better idea. Perfect. Best idea ever. Well, this is our life for the next little bit. And off we go. Oh dear. Hi guys. What are you guarding? Gold in here? What do we get? Bunch of quartz. Oh, hello. Well, hello, hello. Yep. Let's just block you off. <gasps> really? This is much closer to home. Actually, not much closer to home, but like a quarter of the way closer to home than the one we're going to fix up today. Well, well, well. Just mark you right here. Today is already shaping up to be a good day. Well, we are back from our wildly successful trip, where we picked up a cheap forlorn hope helm, as well as we were able to sell a whole bunch of stuff and got some colored glass. And yes, that last find was quite, quite the find along the way. And now, I forgot I already bought some red, but now at least we have... All but green, because green we can make ourselves with El Chipo Olivino over here. So I'm going to go ahead and play some Inventory Management Simulator. And then we'll get over to the Translocator and the Gold. We'll bring some stuff for fixing those up with us. Okay, everyone, and we are off. We are heading over to our new location for getting gold which houses one of the translocators we know about, one of the two. I think we will make a pit stop along the way and check out that first one, or the one nearest to us. I will see you over there. Hi, guys. So I did bring some lanterns just to at least temporarily light this up. Just, I don't feel like dealing with these guys too, too much today. And these are not going to stay here, but I wanted to at least light the place up while we are working in the area. There we go. So let's go ahead and we'll just clear out this junk, make some room for ourselves in here. And there we go. And then we'll go ahead and fix this bad boy right up. There we go. And while this is thinking about how it's going to serve us properly, we are going to put in a door right there. And then we will just finish off this little bit right here with some cobblestone. go. So for this first one, let's head on through and we'll see what we're at. And we will make it a safe place to go. Hopefully. Boom. Yeah, where are we? We are somewhere somewhat deep, I think. I don't see our coordinates for some reason. That's 
it's a tainted drifter. So let's go ahead and retreat to here. We'll drop a door there. And we'll call that a day. Okay, fix the coordinate overlay. We are at 46. And we are... We are a good ways west of home. We're a pretty serious ways west of home. Okay. Oh, and here's another translocator that we found before. Okay. We're an andesite, basically, from bottom to top. Okay, heading home. You could pick, like, any of these spots, but you didn't. You didn't. Okay, well, let's be off to... Hey, look, Terra Preta. Let's be off to our next stop. Let me go ahead and mark this, because why not? So, for our next stop, we are going to put down some temporary roots, and I will kind of turn the translocator room into an actual little sort of base, if you will. But first, I do have a question, and I want to announce that I have invented mid-video keyboard voting. Here's how it works. So, if you want me to dig out the gold first, press Alt F4. If you want me to repair and explore the translocator first, Press Control W. Okay, okay, I'm kidding. Don't don't do either of those. That'll that'll close your browser. Don't don't do either of those. I was kidding. There is no such thing as oh hello, as voting with your keyboard. Let's get down here and we are going to drop by here. Can we get down here. Oh no, this is the oh, that's the back of the cave, sort of. I want to go in this way. Somewhere. There you are. Ow. Okay, so we should probably go ahead and... Let's get to the translocator. Maybe set down some lanterns in here. Just to keep things... Do I don't think that was the translocator room. Oh, this place is gross one back in here, and we'll drop one here as well. So you are in shadow, and you are in shadow. And then we'll head down, let's hear you, you're a dead end, so we'll just head down this way, and we'll drop some lanterns along the way. Like that. And here we are. There's our door, and then we're going to clean this place up, and we will have a nice little kitchenette and other stuff here so we can kind of come back to this place and sleep the night away, sleep the drifters away, and perhaps some more food. So I'll see you all in a minute. And like that, we have a little home away from home, all almost prepped for my bed go. There you are. Now it's prepped. We have everything we need to survive for a little bit. We've got a campfire over here. I have a little bit of food in this chest. And we've got our bed and a bunch of storage. And this is where all of the quartz that we gather is going to go. Because we don't really need any of the quartz, I don't think. We must just need the gold. So I think we should just get to it. And once again, I did not bring any bombs. And that was on purpose. And that's because... The gold ore is so sparse that I don't really want to risk losing 10% of it and 100% of any crystals we might get that could fill in any gaps. So let's go ahead and let's start mining. We will burn out this pickaxe first and then move on from there. So I do want to grab a couple samples. I would prefer the samples to be of poor ore, not like rich or anything. Oh dear. I hear friends. You know what, though? I could... could paper over this before we really get started. I think we'll do that. Because so I do not feel like dealing with a million drifters and the threat of falling into an infinitely deep pit. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Don't need that in my life. 
Okay, everyone. It is the next morning, and this is now sealed off. And this side actually has a bunch of silver in it. So I'm not as interested in the silver, but while we're here, I may as well get it. So with that being said, I think it's time. Let's get to it. Excuse me, sir or madam, but can I have the time? Oh, really? Is it time? Time for more 20 questions? Well then, I guess we better get to it. Before we delve into my answers to your inquiries, I'd like to take a moment to give a big thanks and shout out to Toshiko. She's a mod over on the Gaming with Kurozark community Discord server, and she put together the wonderful banner that flies over the content on my Patreon page. I love it, and I hope you do too. So, special thanks to Toshiko for her great work. And now, let's get into answering your questions. Waifulu asks, Can we be friends? No, I don't have friends. Redneck Woman asks, Are resin spawns in pine forests and savannas the same, or do they have different spawns based on local temperature? I can't say for certain, but I would suspect that since a lot of the game's generation is based on randomized heat maps, that the presence of resin is either its own heat map or tied to an existing one. Maybe the fertility heat map? But I can confirm that pine trees in the south can also have resin, as we found some near the one trader, the treasure hunter trader, just south of base. Well, the second one, south of base. Critical Pixel asks, Since Vintage Story cannot be completed, if someone wanted to speedrun an aspect of the game, what would you say would be a good goal? I would say speedrun to the Copper Age. No, just kidding. You can do that in under an hour, easy. For speedrunning a game aspect, you'd want to choose something like automating a help hammer or possibly steel production. I don't think Vintage Story lends itself well to speedrunning in general, because while there is progression, it's not always linear, and you can often jump over some steps along the way, but also end up really blocked by gating materials as well. I have seen challenge runs. GG Beyond did a Survive in Hardcore for One Year challenge in 1.16. Hypnotic is doing a One Chunk Survival playthrough. And Pier Piranissimo is doing an Arctic Survival challenge, also with permadeath. And if that wasn't enough, the Odd Ape is playing in Italian. Can you imagine that? Italian! Leon Oliveira, who has two questions, asks, What is a good day-to-day -day armor in the game? You seem to be using something that doesn't look like clothing aside from the full plate armor. So I am wearing blue dyed tailored gambeson, which we made back in the Whoa Dude 23rd episode. If you're not a tailor, you'll need to turn off the class exclusive craftables, which is done at world creation or later on using a command, which can be found on the wiki. If you don't want to turn off the class exclusive stuff and can settle for less, two modes, active and passive use. You can see them in the handbook for your shield. In passive use, which means not crouching, shields only block 15% of the time, and they block less damage, typically about half. Active use means crouching, and then the block rate shoots up to 90%, and about double the damage blocked. In addition, while I haven't done a lot of testing, in my experience, it also seems that the shield has to be in your offhand slot in order to be effective. I've taken a lot of unblocked hits while trying to use it in my right hand, but I'll need to play with it a bit and find out if my hunch is correct. Closed Space Fire asks, Can traders be moved? Unfortunately, no, they cannot be moved. If you try to move a trader more than a couple dozen blocks away from their origin point, they will despawn when you leave the area. And I'm not sure whether they ever come back or not. They also ask, If you could move them, would you build a small city for them? I say, absolutely. Maybe not a city, but at least a small village. Silent Storm Kaba asks, since you're a lefty, what's your favorite style of can opener? Okay, so I have feelings, capital F feelings about this. This is going to be a longer answer than you bargained for, so buckle in, buddy. All right, so there are some quirks and concessions about being a lefty in a righty's world. One means of coping is buying lefty-specific tools. The other is finding sometimes creative ways of using tools meant for right-handers. I generally fall into this latter category. In fact, I cannot think of a single tool design for lefties that I use. Lefty scissors? Nah. I just gum the paper. Lefty loosey? Nah. Righty tidy. As for can openers, I use them the way a righty would. I hold the clamp part with my left hand and I turn the crank with my right. But I definitely have a preference. 
the absolute 100% best can opener you will ever find is one you'll probably have to go to a thrift shop if you want one. I will use none other than a Swing Away brand can opener, but under no circumstances will I use one made after about the 1980s or so. Their engineering tolerances, like basically every other product that survived through the ages, are way looser than they used to be. The parts just don't line up as well as they used to, and you'll end up cursing like a sailor when it derails. So, you want to go to a thrift shop and find an older opener. The handles will probably be covered in plastic that's tan or off-white, sometimes by design or sometimes just by age. Brown and red handles are also good. I think the black ones didn't become common until later, but I could be wrong about that. I'm sure there's someone out there who is a big swing away can opener aficionado and they will correct me in the comments. If the cutter wheel is slightly rusted or just black, that's fine, as long as the whole thing isn't too rusted. Mine is from like the 1970s and it never fails. My mother's can opener is just as old and works just as perfectly. I also have a newer one and have used newer ones at my relatives' houses and all of them slip all the time. Don't mess around. Buy a vintage swing away and you'll never need one again. Also, Swingway, if you'd like to sponsor a video, you know, well, get in touch. <laughs> Archaic, sorry, their name is all in caps. Archaic asks, can you tame locusts? Technically, yes, but that yes comes with a big asterisk. It's also something that I haven't tinkered with, so I'm not 100% sure how it works. From what I know, though, is that in short, you need a tuning spear in order to turn a locust into a friend. Smack that locust with a spear, and 20% of the time, it works every time, and you get a friend. I do know that having more than one friendly locust makes them fight each other, but that's about it. I'm not really aware of whether there's a time limit, but I suspect they aren't permanent friends. TJ asks, have you considered the medieval mod pack that introduces Aurochs and whatnot to the game? I am aware of the sorcery of which you speak, and it's an interesting mod. I never added it to this game for a couple of reasons. One, which is the big one, is that it adds more to the game than I wanted. The second thing is that, at least at the time that I was getting the guide series going, the mod had issues with the animals not exactly respecting property rights. It was common to arrive home to find a family of aurochs just in your living room. That issue may have been patched out, but it's important to me for the series mod list to remain stable. Maybe I'll revisit the idea in a future series. Rivi asks, Have you written any books, or do you have plans to? As a matter of fact, I have, and I do. Writing has been my deepest, truest passion since I was 11 years old. I really got serious about writing during my senior year of high school, and then it wasn't until college that I ever actually finished a manuscript. I've completed five since then, including numerous rounds of editing and changes from beta reader feedback and so on. Unfortunately, the publishing world is notoriously difficult to break into, and as of this video, I only have one book out in the wild, one that I self-published as an ebook for the Amazon Kindle. I'm uh, a little shy about naming myself here on the channel at the moment, but if you think you'd be interested in checking it out, feel free to ping me over on the Discord server and I can DM you the details. If the idea of reading something I've written is popular enough though, I might consider talking about it more publicly. And yes, I realize just how bad I am at selling myself. It's an inherited trait. Derek, in all caps, asks, have you ever played Dwarf Fortress, or do you have any interest in it now that it has new graphics and mouse-compatible user interface in its Steam release? I tried playing Dwarf Fortress maybe seven or eight years ago, but I found its ASCII-based iconography too arcane to pierce. I could tell there was a deep game behind it, so I found a community-created graphics mod and installed it. I played a little, but I didn't really find myself getting sucked in, and I put it down for good. While I really enjoy RimWorld, that is the only game inspired by Dwarf Fortress that I've really enjoyed, so I'm not certain that the original Big Daddy Dwarf Fortress is quite the game for me. It could be worth another shot at some point, but it wouldn't be something I dive into in the near future at any rate. Well everyone, that is all of the 20 questions that you have submitted in the last few weeks, and that wraps up 20 questions segment number 11. So big thank you to everyone who submitted questions, and if you'd like to submit your own, drop them in a comment with the hashtag 20 questions, or you can put them in the 20 questions channel over in the Discord server. All right, everyone. Ow. That wraps up our gold mining expedition, and I hope you enjoyed my answers to your questions. So I have a trunk right here in front of me, and it has all of the gold and silver we've mined, except for the samples, which I removed for just keeping them separate. But we got some native silver and gold ore in each of the three materials we've been mining through, which is 
shale, granite, and slate. And in this chest, we have a whole bunch of all of that. Everything you see here on the right-hand side of the trunk is gold and silver, with the halfway line right here. So on the left of that is silver, and the right is gold. And I think, I think we have enough gold here to make enough plates and pieces of chain to build, or rather refurbish, our Forlorn Hope armor. If it isn't, I will cry. So anyway, that does wrap up this expedition. We do have the matter of this guy. So we should go ahead and probably fix you up a little bit. And now we have a functioning translocator. But before we go through it, I think we need to go back and get our armor ready. Sorry for the fake out. So I want to go ahead and pack all of this stuff into this chest over here, as well as into my inventory. And we will hike all this back over to our home and smash it with a hammer, and we'll see how much we get. As we're on the way back, I just wanted to note just how well lit that windmill is and how far away you can see it. I actually saw it as like a speck, like way over here in the lake as I was swimming across. But the distance you can see stuff at in this game is really cool. Okay, so we've got our hammer. And the first thing we're going to smash is... I want to do the silver. I did already marry the silver in quartz in granite into these guys. It was just uh, nine of the rich and eight of the bountiful. I just didn't want to clutter up our storage with more silver than it could really handle. Which looks like we might be doing anyway. Okay, there we go. So we now have basically two stacks of silver nuggets, which is 12 ingots or six plates. So, pretty cool. Now, for what we're all waiting for, we already have 18 nuggets of gold here. But let's go ahead and see just how much gold we get from smashing all of these chunks. So we got three stacks and 31 pieces. If we marry that into our 18 here, end up with enough for nine plates plus enough for another plate and a half. So effectively 10 plates of gold right now. So the helm takes one plate. Okay, one plate and iron chain. The breastplate takes two plates, three plates, and some iron chain and some blue cloth, which we have. And the greaves take one plate. Oh, that's not bad. So, what, four plates? We can do that easy. We can make two of these. Or fix two of these up. So, with that being said, I think it's time that we... Well, we need to rejigger some of the stuff up in our forge because, like I said, I forgot to make an actual smeltery up there. So I'm going to go get our ingot molds from downstairs and bring them up to our new permanent home, or their permanent home, up on the mountain. And I'll bring some of this stuff up as well. We need the plates, and I do need to eventually move like the rest of this stuff up there, but it doesn't need to happen today. But first, on our way up, we should check this. Yes, okay. We have our first blister steel ready to go. So we will do that later, I think. Maybe even just between episodes, because you already know what that looks like. Let's go up here, and we need to fix this a bit. And then we need to get a smelton. Up we go. Thank you. There we go, and there we go. And then we can build and then deconstruct these. Like so. And let's find a place for our tools. Which I guess we'll just go here. And we'll put our spare hammer up right there. And then as far as where to put our ingot molds, I'm kind of thinking that, like, yeah, maybe on the wood isn't the best place, but it's the place we got. So they get to go here. Cool. It fits exactly, which is kind of weird, but hey, I'll take it. And then we have our crucible. One of you there. Chuck you in there. 
And then we do need some good fuel from upstairs. Gold has a surprisingly high melting point. And then, while that is heating up, we need to heat up eight plates for eight chains of iron. And we'll need that in order to upgrade the super busted pieces into the only partly busted pieces of the Fordorn Hope. And then once it gets hot, we will start hammering out some chains, because that's totally how you hammer or make chain mail, right? You just sort of pop squares out of a an iron plate to make like a lattice work, right? That, that's how that works. Yeah. I'm a medieval armor smith. I know what I'm doing. Okay, let's grab our plates again. Get them out of the way. And then let's go ahead and grab the armor. And first, I kind of want to see how bad it looks while wearing it in this state. Yeah, it's in, uh... It's in pretty sorry shape. I mean, we can see, like, I don't know, a quarter of our clothes through it. You can tell that it was once really nice, though. So, with that crunch, with that being said, let's go and grab our bit of fabric that we need. There we go. And then let's... We'll take this off, first of all. And let's repair each of these once. So you need just a piece of chain to become the damaged helmet. You need a bunch of stuff, so we have two iron chains on each side. We have the gold chain, and we have the blue cloth. It gives us the damaged breastplate. And then you have the three last chains. Okay, so we counted right there. Go me! And then let's see how they look when they're damaged. So, interesting. So, like, there's that, uh... I'm not sure what the right word is, but that sort of plate on the knee that's sort of askew. And the breastplate itself, like, look, it's crooked on us. That's interesting, even when we're not, like, carrying anything in particular. Yep, it's crooked, but it's getting there. Let's go ahead and let's finish it out. So, for the greaves, we need... Three iron plates and one gold plate, like so. For the breastplate, we need four more iron plates and two gold plates. Nice. And for the helm, we need one iron plate and one gold plate. And the last two, like I said, are for new blackguard shields once we get leather working and dyeing going. So... Much, much better. Look at that. Boy, are we fancy looking. Look at that sun symbol on the front. Oh boy, is that handsome. And what's really interesting is I still love playing with the difference in speed that you get from each of these options here. So if we grab this guy off of here, we can run around, and you can already feel like this is faster than our steel. Oh, by a whole lot, it feels... I mean, I'm sure it's not, like, more than, what, a few percent? This is minus eight percent. This is minus fourteen, so we are losing... A total of 18% walk speed going from the Forlorn Hope to the Steel. So, yeah, it is quite the difference. Anyway, I think for now we are going to drop this back on here. And then we will bring our steel through to the other side of the translocator with us, just in case there's anything nasty there. But I think it's time for us to go and take a look at that translocator and just see what there is to see on the other side. No more suspense. And at the same time, we will also go the right way out of the house. We will also go and clean up the extra lanterns that are scattered around both caves, just because we don't really need that many lanterns there. 
Okay, in we go. And I think I'll leave the lanterns until we are leaving, just so that we don't have, you know, drifters spawning in our absence. But here we go. Let's get these ready to go. Got a lantern out so we can drop one. Oh, and I left some materials here. Here you are, so we can block it off and drop a door in as needed. Let's go. And we are pretty deep once again. Not super duper deep, but pretty deep. Let's go ahead and we will just plop a lantern there. I'm already hearing growls. Why don't we go see what's out here real quick? Ooh, we got a glowworm cave nearby. That's cool. Hi, buddy. Whoever you are. Oh, hey. Bye. This is a wild cave once again. More glowworms in that direction. Big ol' shaft there. Ooh, and two directions to go here. What's down? Trouble, of course. Oh, hi, guy. Do you mind? Okay, so this could be a neat place to explore. Judging by where we came out and where our icons are, I think we're once again to the far west of home. But let's go ahead and we'll get our door in. And then we'll get some walls in here to shore this up. There we go. It's home away from home. And with a bit of cleanup, we can turn this into a proper little way station. Okay. And all cleaned up. And yep, just confirming we are both... We're like west-southwest of home. And it looks like we are in a big... Either shale or basal. I want to say shale area. It could be... No, that, that's basalt, I'm pretty sure. And up above, we have a merchant over there. Good to know. Some kind of trees. Some jungle right in here. Anyway, let's get home and let our gear recover. And we'll pick up our lanterns and finish out the day. And it's medium. Of course it is. Well, everyone... I think that is about all we have time for in this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you enjoyed our mining spree and our restoration of our second set of Forlorn Hope armor, as well as the discovery of a second translocator right near our first one. And once again, I want to give a massive, massive thanks to Toshigo for her incredible work on the Patreon banner. So if you see her on Discord, tell her how great of a job she did. If you want to check out the Patreon, you can get early access to videos as well as downloadable goodies, including higher quality videos and world save file downloads. As always, my name has been Corazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.